Okay, let's talk a little bit more in depth, but not too deep on the, this overall, we keep calling this PFMA, potential pheromone analysis process. So a couple of things I'd like to highlight here is let's first of all, make sure we all have kind of a common understanding of what a PFMA is, what it includes, discuss some of the benefits and limitations of a potential pheromone analysis, what can it do for us, what can it do for us. We'll talk about, again, kind of at a high level, what the, the process and the steps are in that process, and then discuss both from the core and the FERC approaches for how we define what failure is in coming up with failure modes, as well as how we brainstorm or identify failure modes and moving forward. Then we'll talk about the kind of differences and similarities in how we both go through the screening process as far as trying to evaluate which failure modes we would eventually carry into a risk analysis, which ones we would exclude or kind of leave behind and providing a rationale for that. So first of all, what is a potential failure mode analysis? Well, in, in very high level terms, we're looking at potential failure modes. So individual failure modes that describe a step or steps that must occur to cause a dam or a levy failure resulting in some kind of consequences. So something bad has to happen from all of this stuff, okay? So the PFMA is just a methodology. It's a method of analysis where all those different ways a dam or levy can fail are identified, they're brainstormed, they're discussed, they're ranked against each other to determine which would be the most critical and should be considered in greater detail to spend more time, more involvement in, in discussion to capture the structure's overall risk. So again, as Nate talked about this morning, this is kind of the backbone. This is that foundation building block for everything that we do going forward in the, in the entire risk analysis process. So we have to get this part right. Otherwise, it may invalidate everything else that we end up doing in the risk analysis. We've left something out. So some just high level benefits of what, what can the PFMA do for us? Well, one, it certainly can enhance the dam and levy safety inspection process. So as we go through developing failure modes, it can help us focus our inspections at critical locations that are identified in the failure mode, where certain vulnerabilities might be uh, more likely to occur uh, on that and, and in the process as far as where we might focus our inspections, whether they're, they're daily in, uh, inspections from operating staff or, or in a periodic inspection. So we can identify failure modes that maybe aren't typically considered, say, by normal analytical methods. Uh, I know I spent a great deal of my early career just kind of cranking through stability analyses for embankment dams. You know, we have a tool that can do that kind of stuff, and so you spend a lot of time focusing on stability, which come to find out that's not one of our kind of leading um, methods of failure or mechanisms of failure in embankments. But we have a tool that can do it, and we can spend lots of time. But again, looking early in my career, didn't spend a lot of time looking at an internal erosion. We didn't have a tool to be able to do that, right? We maybe looked at filter compatibility, and that was just one part of internal erosion. So looking at it through the, the failure mode process, what are all the different events that have to happen in that kind of process that, to, that could result in failure? So being able to break that process down into steps to describe what has to happen uh, can be very helpful, I'll say, in, in our evaluation compared to traditional ways we've looked at things. It can enhance and focus our instrumentation monitoring program. Again, as we're going through this overall process of describing how the, the, this particular ferry mode starts, it, it continues, progresses, maybe leads to breach. Where's our best opportunity? Where's our earliest opportunity to be able to see that that process is actually active and, and increasing, perhaps? Better not to try to catch it at the very end, right? We're just left with maybe some kind of heroic intervention or reservoir drawdown or something. Be great to be able to capture that as, as early in that process as possible. And so again, we can focus. So how would we actually monitor for that? Are there instrumentation or other things that we could actually install to help us give a clue of something happening? It can identify shortcomings, oversights, and data, limited information analysis that we might have. We'll go through, you know, a failure mode and say, "Wow, I really don't have any information to evaluate this." We've got foundation liquefaction. Like I don't have blow counts on the foundation. How am I going to evaluate this? It can identify potential dam or levy safety risk reduction measures as well. So as we go through the whole failure mode process for each failure mode, we're wanting to think about, so kind of just strategizing, how could we reduce the likelihood of failure of this? What, what could we do to intervene 
to be able to reduce the likelihood of that. So we want to capture those things, help us to be thinking a, a bit more outside the box. Okay, so so as great as all that sounds, right? You know, there's no problem. This is all we ought to be able to do, right? There, there are certainly limitations to this entire process. So the robustness of the results is highly dependent on the experience of the facilitator and the breadth of technical experience of the team that's actually performing the potential ferry mode analysis. And we'll talk in a lot more detail about that this afternoon, about why some of the guidance has changed in recent years to be able to capture this, to try to be able to minimize the, the impacts of this. So inexperienced team, you know, not really looking at the data, maybe not a lot of, lot of experience to draw from, might not develop as many failure modes, might have more difficulty in evaluating failure modes as perhaps somebody that has, or, or a team that has a great deal of breadth of technical expertise and experience in being able to evaluate that. So again, if the process isn't followed in a, in a structured approach, it can lead to overlooking or missing failure modes or even perhaps even misrepresenting or improperly assessing the importance of failure modes. And I'll say that was one of the spotlights that the Oroville Forensics Team report highlighted, uh, at least from, from the FERC process of saying, you know, you all haven't been quite so structured in how you go about identifying failure modes going through the process. Uh, again, I know most of the failure modes I've, or failure mode analyses I've been in, you know, when you're going through the brainstorming process, you're, I mean, some people re refer to it as spitballing. You know, you're just trying to look at a bunch of different failure modes, you're trying to capture it, and you're kind of jumping all around and uh, as far as features on the, on the project, loading conditions, failure mechanisms, and things like that. So again, we'll talk a bit more about that here, about why a structured approach might be a better way to be able to, to, uh, to do this. And then the results can be susceptible to individual biases or other group dynamic and factors. And so again, the guidance, both the core and us, you know, we, we talk about this in the sense that the potential ferry mode analysis is, is from an engineering standpoint, very unique in that it's, it's not only uh, analytical in the process, but it, there's also a creative part to all of this. It's also not something that just one person can typically do on their own. Uh, and it's got to be done not only in a group, but having everybody kind of providing some oversight and some checks and balances kind of through the process. And particularly from a regulatory perspective, I'll just say, you know, it's maybe very easy for, for us to be able to check somebody's stability analysis or some kind of dam break analysis, look at the input assumptions, run something independently. It's very difficult to do in a potential ferry mode analysis. There's a lot more of the group effort. There's a lot more opportunity for group dynamics to come into, into play, biases to be able to enter into that. And so there, there are a lot of other cautionary things when we talk about this kind of analysis that, that come, into the, come into play that we may not otherwise have in, say, some of our other typical engineering analyses. So limitation. So again, before we kind of dive into the, the overall process, just some kind of high-level guiding principles here. So... Uh, Carmen did a great job talking about, you know, the diligence and searching for and obtaining all the project and background information. And I know each project may have its own struggles as far as trying to identify, you know, where that information is. Ownership may have passed over the years, you know, from, from owner to owner or, you know, fires and floods and just things getting lost in the process. But, but still trying to do, you know, the best job you can in being able to identify that because without that, you know, there's more judgment, there might be more need for additional investigations. You know, some things we'll just never see again. You know, construction photographs that document, you know, how the, the methodology that was used for the embankment or concrete placement or excavations are just invaluable information. And no amount of borings or drilling or geophysics or whatever we can do is ever gonna be able to replace, you know, that, that kind of information. So important to be able to do that. So once all that's gathered, you know, then it's very important for the team to actually set aside time and individuals to, to be able to read that information. So if the dam owner, the levy owner has gone through all this effort to pull this information together, you're prepared for the PFMA and the team isn't reviewing that information, well, you kind of missed a great opportunity there, right? Because through that information, you, you identify potential vulnerabilities, other things that might not be up to kind of today's standard of practice to be able to identify as, hey, you know, maybe we ought to at least talk about this, you know, as, as a failure mode before we just dis dismiss it. If you don't know about it, it, it's one of those things that you, you, you can never kind of resurrect again. So very important to be able to do that. 
and, and I hate to say sometimes often overlooked, you know, in that process. We go through all of these things and we're chucking boxes and now we don't leave time to be able to go in and, and, and do those kinds of really important things too. So we want to make sure that folks, as they're coming into the PFMA sessions, you're open. You're, you're thinking in, in, a, in a, a non, or a, actually a very critical, and we'll talk about it, you know, kind of a, a detective approach, forensics approach, kind of looking at this to understand, you know, how, how the dam could fail, understand the failure modes, the, the failure scenarios, and, and to think kind of globally here. So it's also a willingness of, of all parties to try to set aside maybe their normal responsibilities. So we, we can often see this when it may be a, a, a supervisor or some high level person is, is in the room and you have other maybe subordinates in there where the, maybe the subordinates have really good ideas, but they're hesitant to want to be able to provide information. They don't want to say look bad, you know, in front of their, their boss or something like that. Or from a standpoint, you know, operation staff at times are like, they may be intimidated. There are a bunch of engineers in the room and boy, these are supposed to be smart people. And so obviously they don't know us very well from that standpoint, but, but they have so many things to offer as far as operational and other vulnerabilities that maybe they've, they've seen that we don't have the information to be able to help with that. So you wanna be able to set all those things aside. Everybody take off you know, their robes and their hats and you know, let's, let's, just, let's just talk. Huh? So getting into the process. So basically you have six steps in the overall PFMA process. So we've talked about a number of these already. So obviously we're gonna go out Identify the team. We'll talk more about that one after, right after lunch. But we've talked about collecting the background information, reviewing the information, conducting the site visit. So all that background to be able to help us kind of focus ourselves. And then we want to conduct the session and then obviously document. So we can go through all of this work, you know, and collecting information, talking about stuff, doing a really great session. And if we can't provide a really good written documentation of that, Again, we've lost a great opportunity. And again, that's one of the harder things in the PFMA process because of all the information, all the discussions that might be captured. You know, how do you actually put that now in the written word? Because that's what's there now for posterity. That's what the next teams will be looking at, you know, as they go to build on this, this process. So before we jump into the session itself, let, let, let's talk about this. So, so generally in a PFMA session, before before you get into the actual identification, the brainstorming of failure modes, you, you have a number of presentations that kind of make sure the team's all on the same page, right? You might have some geologic discussion, foundation explorations, here's the design, the construction, the various features, all of that, and then typically we just jump right into it, right? So I'll just say in chapter 17 of, of the FERC guidance, we've kind of injected this, this idea of before, before you go past all the technical information that, that we as mostly as engineers you know, love to be able to roll up our sleeves and get into, let's make sure we don't forget about the operational aspect and think about how this dam functions as a system on that. How are all the interrelationships and dependencies, you know, as far as release capacity or re release features and things like that, how does that all work? So not only from a physical standpoint, yes, water comes in the reservoir, it goes to one feature, another feature, a gate opens or closes, or you know, once it gets high enough, it goes to another one. You want to understand all of that. But then what, what is the human aspect of that? You know, what kind of controls are, are in place to be able to monitor for reservoir levels? If something goes bad, you know, how, how do you get notification that something else is going on? Who makes decisions as far as opening something or closing something you know, for, from an overall uh, maybe flood risk management standpoint? What does access to the site look like? Who, you know, it, does somebody need some kind of authorization or check or verification before you move the gate up to the next level? How does all that work? And on a sunny day, there are no, typically no problems with that. But what happens when there's communication difficulties? What are backup systems look like? Not only for communications, but power supply. Do you have all the right equipment? You really want to be able to understand all of that because again, that enters into these vulnerabilities that we might want to consider either as a separate failure mode or they might become factors that we'll talk about here in a minute about these more likely or less likely factors that we want to be able to consider in this failure mode process. So we want to be able to understand all of that before kind of just jumping right in to, to trying to brainstorm or identify failure modes, okay? So again, session, we talk about first step then, we're trying to identify individual failure modes, 
We want to describe them so that all the team understands each failure mode individually. We want to go through the screening process because as we go through the, the identification of failure modes, we might have tens or even hundreds of these that we have to be able to evaluate. And we'll talk about not, not all failure modes are created equal. So we want to be able to find a way to be able to screen these so that we're really spending our, our energy and resources on those failure modes that are going to make a difference, be able to get the other ones kind of out of the way. Then we want to evaluate them. And we'll talk about each one of these steps. Okay? So there are some subtle differences between kind of definition of failure between both FERC and the core. But from the standpoint of the way we've all been doing failure mode processes in, in the past, you know, it's all focused for the most part on loss of the reservoir. So that's the first bullets for both agencies. Sudden rapid uncontrolled release of impounded water or liquid borne solids. So you have some kind of release of the reservoir. The core goes on and says, hey, there's some other, other things that you're gonna wanna be mindful of here when we talk about failure. That includes loss of service with, with an economic risk only. So something that might be related, for example, you know, closure of a navigation lock that, that might have, have uh, severe economic consequences you know, associated with that. Or inability of the damming surface to function properly, leading to some kind of upstream consequence you know, associated with that. So, so it goes a bit beyond just this idea of, hey, loss of the reservoir, right? So again, in, in our response to the, the Oroville Independent Forensics Team report, again, where they were somewhat critical and, and rightly so in identifying said, you know, you all are just focused on loss of the reservoir, but there are other failure modes like we just had at Oroville, you know, from the report saying, you know, there's some pretty severe consequences from this. Didn't, didn't have any uncontrolled release. But, but pretty impactful, and, and from a dam safety standpoint, you probably to be aware of those things and not just brush those off so quickly. So things like inability of project features or components to perform their intended function, project features or components performing in an impaired or compromised fashion. That might include things like misoperation of different features of gates, opening a gate when you intended to close it or vice versa, you know, and things like that. So we'll talk a bit more about that here as well. So again, those have to result in something bad happening, okay? So bit broader definition of failure than what we've had in the past. That broader definition of failure ends up resulting in like, likely uh, identifying additional failure modes that maybe we hadn't really considered in the past. So let's talk about this brainstorming process. So again, this, is, this has been evolving over the last few years. So brainstorming is intended to be this this group effort, this group thought, uh, suggesting failure modes in an environment that's non-judgmental. It's, it's free and spontaneous where there are no wrong answers. So I use the example, if somebody is, is brainstorming and we're, you're going through this and says, I think uh, a dinosaur could come and plant their foot on the dam and just completely annihilate it, you smile at them and you write it down, okay? So we, we want to be able to have this where, where folks are not being criticized for, well, that's a, dumb, that's a dumb suggestion. Why would you say that? It shuts everything down in the room. P people will not be trying to think about, well, what, what should I consider here? Because a lot of times, you know, we might find a really good idea, you know, from a, from a smart person in the room to be able to say, I, you know, I had actually never thought of that. I am glad that we've gone through, you know, trying to come up with that. So we will eventually get to judging all those failure modes, but this isn't the time or the place to be able to do that, okay? No wrong answers. We wanna think about uh, beyond the, the traditional standards. So again, those, those engineering analyses that sometimes we so heavily rely on, you know, stability and other, other types of things like that, we wanna be thinking about, so how, how could this dam actually fail? If water is seeping through here, could it carry material to there? I mean, trying to, trying to really co consider all the different ways this dam can fail. So this is our opportunity to really dig in and, and make sure we haven't forgotten something. Are we gonna be 100% successful every time? Absolutely not. There will be unknowns, unknown unknowns all of the time. We just wanna be able to reduce that the best to our best of our ability. Ralph Peck talked about the, this idea of creative thinking, you know, saying, hey, beware of that oddball. You know, you look at typical embankment sections or typical this or typical that. So what about the atypical stuff? 
You know, what about these areas where certain features are transitioning to something else or, or there's a boundary or something like that? You know, we want to be able to consider things like that and not just kind of think in typical terms of things that we come at because, you know, Ralph Peck spent a, a great deal, deal of his career going around looking at forensic, th forensic things where it's like, well, this was a kind of an atypical thing that happened here. So we ought to be thinking that way. Again, we talked a little bit early, got to think like detectives or coroners, you know, from a forensic work. We need to be looking for those things that, that maybe just don't look quite right to us on that. There, there might be some uh, a text or, or verbiage in a, in a construction report, and then there might be an accompanying construction photograph, and it's like, so, something doesn't still look right here. They talked about all this compaction that they're doing around these things, but you know, I see all these construction photographs and I have yet to see a piece of compaction equipment anywhere. Did they really do some of these things? So, so you really gotta be kind of thinking, you know, it's like, does all of this make sense? Could there be some other vulnerability? So again, in the, in the, in the brainstorming part, we're just throwing ideas out, right? We'll evaluate it later on, on whether that could actually be, be true or not. PFMs can and do cross disciplines. I know that's brand new to everybody here in the room, right? So, you know, you might be a geotech or a structural or an H&H, &H, and so, yes, you're focused on your, your technical discipline, and you should be, you know, make sure that we capture all those. But we can't lose sight, though, also, of these other failure modes that kind of cross technical disciplines. You know, Scour has multiple disciplines that need to actually be able to look and evaluate that. Uh, other things like, you know, the example here, seismic deformation of a concrete structure might lead to initiation of internal erosion in the embankment. That deformation, you know, during earthquake shaking may cause a, a gap or a crack, uh, you know, adjacent to a wall that has backfill against it. And so what does that end up doing? Could that crack penetrate down to allow water to seep along that and begin, begin to erode material? So we gotta, we gotta be thinking in, in broader terms here so we're not missing something. And then the brainstorming session must be structured and methodical to minimize the possibility of missing a potential fair mode. So again, I kind of alluded to this earlier in the, in the past. It, uh, in the past, we've, we've been kind of, I want to say, a, a bit more random in how we've done our brainstorming on that. And, and so our new guidance for FERC says, hey, we, we need to be systematic about this. We need to look at things structure by structure, loading condition by loading condition, failure mechanism by failure mechanism, and if we need to, sub-failure mechanism by sub-failure mechanism. So an example, you may have uh, two, three, four, I did, it was on PFMA last week, we had eight different damming surfaces, you know, damming structures. So we had to look at each one of those separately, right, to be able to go through that. So let's take an example, an embankment dam. Let's say, okay, we're gonna start brainstorming, we're gonna start on the, on the main dam here. It's an embankment, here's this configuration, you know, et cetera. Now, we're just gonna start with normal loading conditions. Uh, with that, and then we're going to start looking at, say, internal erosion. So we've got a failure mechanism of internal erosion, and I'm going to break it down even further. I'm going to say, let's just look at the main dam, normal loading condition, internal erosion, only through the embankment right now. What are all the different ways that we could look at internal erosion occurring through this embankment? And we could look at desiccation cracking. We could look at settlement cracking. We could look at backward erosion piping, poorly compacted layer in the embankment. We could talk about all those different things before moving on to say, next sub mechanism, let's look at something through the foundation or embankment into the foundation. Now let's look at contacts or into drains. Let's make sure that we're comprehensive in our approach to do this before we move on to a different loading condition and a different structure, and then making sure that we're thorough in addressing each and every one of those as we go, go forward. Brainstorming, I want to say, in the good old days, you know, used to look like this, right? Flip charts and markers, and we'd stick them all over the walls, right? Now we become really sophisticated. We put them in Excel spreadsheets and, you know, things like that. We project them up, and it's, it's much cleaner that way. So, but it's just like this. I mean, we're, we're just trying to get an idea of, so what are these things? We'll, we'll get into a bit more of a description later on, but, but we're trying to at least get the, the, the concept out there, right? So we say in order not to be biased or constrained perhaps by previously identified failure modes, the brainstorming session should not use lists of previously identified failure modes. And, and I know this, this has been somewhat controversial for, for many folks. And 
And I'll tell you, we, we've just had examples in our pilot studies in trying to do this and looking at kind of previous lists, and we just don't get the same number of failure modes generated when, when folks are anchored to previous lists of failure modes. The teams are, are much more open and, and, and uh, engaged, I'll say. There's a synergy that happens in having to start from a clean slate of paper and going through that. So not that we're going to ever throw away, obviously, those former lists. Once we've gone through the brainstorming process, we feel like we captured everything, we go back and we look at those lists and make sure, hey, have we missed anything in this process? Talked about the description. So we really need to make sure these failure modes are described for what we call the initiation, what starts all of this, all the way to progression. How did it actually reach failure? Whatever your, your definition of failure is at that point. <clears throat> Typically, this, this means you have to have at least these three different elements in your description, an initiator, something that's the failure mechanism that shows how it continues or progresses, and then finally, what's the resulting impact on the structure? So we go through that. So, you know, what's the flaw? How does it initiate? How does it then, after that, continue to progress, say, through an embankment on that all the way to the reservoir that results into what? Gross enlargement, a slump, an overtopping failure, what does that look like? So that everybody knows when we go through to evaluate these, what are we actually talking about here? Where's the location? What does it look like? Should be able to draw a picture of each one of these. We talked about no, not all failure modes will be or are created equal. Some will have more importance, more influence than others. So screening is just that process that we, we do to try to be able to kind of weed out the ones we need to be able to move on from and to be able to focus on the ones we need to take uh, more time to, to consider. So within the FERC process, you know, in the past, we used to kind of screen and go through this process of going through categories one through four, right? Well, we, we've thrown all of that out. This is where everybody cheers, okay? And then, you know, now we're using this more structured approach. So in, in more detail, it, it looks like this. So we go through and say, hey, is, is this failure mode? So again, what, let me start here. So you have all this list of, of failure modes, right? You might have five, you might have 10, you might have hundreds, whatever your project needs, okay? To be able to do that. And then for each one, each failure mode, you start systematically and you say, hey, is that failure mode physically possible? If it is, you can down and say, okay, does it meet parts one and three of our definition of failure? Which is over here, is it uncontrolled release? That's kind of the way we've been doing it in the past. That's familiar to most. Uh, and, and is there some consequence? And so if it does, you come down through this column. If there is no loss of reservoir, but it does meet part two, which is the kind of the operational part of this, what we kind of refer to as damage state on that, you know, then you come down this next, this next uh, column, I'll say. Uh-oh, now I did it. I hit, I hit, I hit the, the damage button here. So there we go. I thought I'd hear us. I thought I'd hear like an alarm go off and you know a, a countdown or something like that. But so so from that from from both those processes, then we come through and we ask: So is that failure mode just so clear, so remote to be considered clearly negligible? And I will say we we kind of struggle with this through some of the pilots. In in and when I say pilot, we had forty one different pilot studies that we had gone through level two risk analyses to kind of get a sense for how this was all gonna work uh, on that. So uh, in, in going through that, what's really important to think about here is when we're talking about clearly negligible, this ought to be something that's really quickly for the team to be able to decide that we can, we can exclude this failure mode because of certain factors, features, et cetera, on that. If it takes the team more than about five minutes to try to make that decision, you ought to just go ahead and include it in your, in, in your uh, list of failure modes that you'll take on to the risk analysis, and you can talk about it more then. But if we talk about it in the screening process for 20, 30 minutes, you know, and then we still decide to carry it on, we, we've lost some efficiency behind that. So we found as engineers, we love the details, we're trying to solve a problem to go through that, and we just wanna talk a little bit more about it. You know, if I, I'm, I'm almost there, but not quite convinced. Again, just carry it forward. You'll, you'll be glad you did from an efficiency standpoint, okay? So if it passes that particular, well, I'll say, so if you can say, yes, this is clearly negligible. That, you know, th this is so unlikely to be able to happen. 
it's considered clearly negligible, goes into that bin. Otherwise, it progresses on through the through the the structure here. And you say, hey, if I'm over here on the on the loss of reservoir, is failure imminent in progress? Hopefully, we don't have many or any of those. Uh, we go into the credible bin. Otherwise, we're we're talking about this kind of damage state. So, would the damages be limited to only the licensee? So, whatever might happen. So, I might again look at say the Oroville example. You know, like yeah, that that was just happening to them. But they had a damaged spillway. No other damages downstream. You come down here and say, well, you know, would it exceed some threshold? We set that threshold at least right now at ten million dollars for the licensees. You can do something lower than that. So, if it's more than $10 million, it's a financial damage state. If it's less than $10 million, it's an asset management to be able to go through. So that's how you go through screening, okay? Those, those things that you rule out or exclude from the process, you have to document the rationale. You just can't say, well, the team decided that this was clearly negligible. It was remote. Well, why was it remote? Provide the factual information. What, what made it remote? There are examples in chapter 17 for FERC of, of, as, as far as what the expectations are for what those justifications will look like. For the core, going through this, it's, it's, it's I'll say somewhat similar in that you're looking for risk drivers and non-risk drivers, okay? Risk drivers are those that, that you move forward. You're gonna describe those in the, in the SQRA. Those are the ones that, that contribute, uh, at least potentially contribute most of the risk. So you want to be able to evaluate at least one risk driver associated with a damming surface that you have, at least one. Take a look at that and see where it's at. If it's high, you might want to go look at some others. Consider the greatest vulnerability on each major project feature, embankment, foundation, spillway, you know, gravity section, uh, you know, things along those lines. And again, trying to look at those to see, you know, in each one of those, is there something else here that we also ought to be considering? Non-risk drivers, again, same thing. You've got to document the rationale. Are these, these are the ones that are physically implausible or non-credible, or they might be credible, but not expected to contribute significantly to the risk. So reasons for the screening from the core process, again, similar to what, what FERC has. Hey, it's just not physically possible. It's not credible then. It might not be a standalone failure mode that was brainstormed. It might just be a factor or something else in another failure mode. There, there's actually no supporting evidence when you start talking about it that, that, that a flaw is even being present. So you can be able to screen that out at that point and looking for evidence of a potential flaw. But the, the screening level analysis indicates it's actually got a very low likelihood of failure based on the loading conditions. It can be justification for screening things out. Or there's insignificant incremental consequences at the critical loading condition. So for example, at a limited you know, uncontrolled release of impounded water. And then finally, for those things that are remote likelihood of failure, something that's less than one in a million with an average life loss of less than a thousand. So again, similar, very similar to FERC. This, this is what we would, we have in our definition for clearly negligible down here. So similar kind of, of screening requirements. So just quickly, just kind of a, a little bit of a crosstalk. Some of this is just from evolution of, of each of the agency's practices and, and, uh, and, and work. So for the FERC folks, you know, PFMA traditionally has gone all the way through the, the evaluation of the likelihoods. So we talked about the identification, description, screening, and then these more likely, less likely factors that we typically look at in a PFMA process. For the core, that becomes part of the SQRA on that. I, I suspect as, as FERC starts moving into more of these L2RAs, we will, we will also probably adopt more of this because this is where we're seeing in the, in the comprehensive assessments the difference between the PFMA and the L2RA is starting to look like, hey, it's right after the screening. Folks want to be able to have a bit more time in between when the PFMA ends and the L2RA begins to start being able to compile some, some additional information, some templates, things like that to be able to help with the L2RA process. So what's this evaluation process? So I'll talk about from the FERC side now, since this is in kind of our PFMA kind of sphere, and, and after this, Nate, we'll talk about what that evaluation looks like from the core process. So again, this is kind of this identifying these influence factors that make the failure mode more likely versus less likely, right? Adverse, favorable. And these are based on the team's understanding of the facility, the information that you've, you know, you've gleaned from looking through all the project records and, and things like that. 
and typically it's captured in a, in a template. And it might look something like this, right? I think those that have done PFMAs before, you've got two columns. This one's favorables on the left, adverses on the right. This kind of bulleted factual information, again, that's gleaned from the, from the various documents and information. FERC has in Chapter 17 a template to be able to capture that kind of information. In, in this form, it's down here at the bottom on evaluation factors. You're more likely, less likely. And it's even broken down to start thinking about. So from a nodal standpoint, when you think about the different aspects of the failure mode progression, from the initiation, continuation, progression, breach, to be thinking about, you know, are there adverse and, and, and um, favorable factors for each one of those kind of elements of the failure mode process to make sure you're, you're kind of thinking that way, okay? Questions on, P, on PFMA. You know, we could, we could spend half a day or longer just kind of talking about this, but in 30 minutes, just want to try to give you a kind of a high level idea of the, of the process. So there's a yellow box with insufficient information PFMs. I'm wondering what you do with those. Do you just hold those off to the side? Is that something you consider evaluating for a later PFM analysis? Or? Yeah, that, that, that is the off-ramp when the team is really stuck. So in, in Chapter 17, we've, we've made that provision. Uh, we encourage folks not to use that box, to be honest, because what happens is failure modes go over there because you just feel like I just don't have enough information to even have any idea, any clue how, how to categorize or prioritize that. So I, what's that, what that's going to end up being is those failure modes that, that the licensee will have to be able to address, right? But, but we're not able to address it in any kind of priority right now because we have no idea from the results of the level two risk analysis where to put those. So we'll have to look at the licensee's plan and schedule you know, when it comes out after everything that comes out of the level two risk analysis, how do these kinds of failure modes also factor in to, to have something to address those in being able to move forward? Because right now we don't know if they're credible, if they're, they have life safety implications, if they just have financial damage state implications, where, where do they go? So we say, do the best job you can in not having to use that box because in, in the end, we feel like it'll help the licensee at least be able to prioritize their dam safety actions better. So it's not, it's not meant to be, oh, you know, I can stick everything over here and life is good and I don't have to worry about it. It becomes more complicated with those. So yeah, we, we do not look at what we, what we will call security kinds of uh, uh, failure modes associated with it. That's done in a completely separate group within FERC that, that does that. And so those, those are kind of off limits from the dam safety fair modes that, that we typically look at. And for the core, that's Department of Homeland Security. Okay. 